first thing, Mr. Bieber, how are you? What a pleasure it is to see you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to see you too. Huh? Uh, I'm fine, I must say. I'm at risk, but yes. <laughs> as I'm confined and uh, I try to do my best, so I'm, uh, I'm quite healthy, I'm good. I think I, like everyone else, um, have been very much looking forward to speaking to you because, you know, um, we've, I've been in isolation now for almost three weeks. Um, I came back from the UK to Singapore where there was a mandatory quarantine. Um, and I think that it's, you know, a good thing. Um, as we are speaking now, the Prime Minister of Singapore is going on the news. Uh, and I think that what's going to be announced is also a lockdown in Singapore, which I think is probably the best thing because I think we need a unilateral lockdown now so that we can minimize the amount of infection. But you know, during this period, it's it's strange as a human being, you go through highs and lows emotionally, you know, and, and to see your face and to, you know, I think there's so many people who respect you and kind of consider you to be really the, 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 the greatest leader of this industry at this moment. I think we've all been, been you know, so, uh, so much looking forward to hearing from you. So, Mr. Beaver, the first thing I would uh, say is thank you so much. Welcome. Um, uh, and what does the watch industry need to do to, to save itself? Because it's, it's, I don't think we've ever seen a crisis like this in our, in, in our lifetime, certainly not in my lifetime. I'm not sure that uh, we have never seen a crisis like that. I think we saw um, much more uh, deeper and bigger crisis um, because the last crisis, big crisis that I remember is uh, end of the 70s and that was a structural crisis. So the Swiss had to reinvent <laughs> their job, more or less, uh, which came with the quartz. And uh, thanks to the Hayek plan, uh, they created this big group called today Swatch Group, and they brought out an incredible watch called Swatch at 50 Swiss francs in quartz, while the Swiss uh, had always been beaten by the Japanese. And suddenly there was a Swiss-made watch at 50 Swiss francs, uh, and so they were capable, they were able to uh, fight against the Japanese and to reconquer uh, their market shares. And then later they went to mechanical watches. Uh, so that was a structural crisis. Now today we only, we only have a crisis of, I mean only, we have an enormous crisis that will kill the economy, we will enter recession, but from the structural point of view, I think we can go on. We have to adapt, of course, because we will have a period before virus and we will have a period after virus. And after virus will not be a copy of before virus. So we will have to re reinvent a lot of uh, elements, uh, the spiritual elements, uh, the philosophical elements, <clears throat> eventually political elements, uh, a lot of concepts will have to be changed <clears throat> and the watch industry has to adapt. But we, uh, the structures are quite safe and they will not change uh, um, uh, profoundly. So for me, the today's crisis, as, <clears throat> uh, as I, I, I'm worried, I'm, it, it's a lot of pain. Uh, we will have a few hundreds of thousands of people dying which is a catastrophe. Uh, the economy will enter recession, which is a catastrophe, but we will recover. And we will recover. <clears throat> and uh, uh, um, uh, the recovery will not be so easy, but on the other hand, uh, it will not take years to recover, I believe. It will take months or even eventually one year. I see a recovery in April, 2021, which is very soon. It's, it's less than a year. <laughs> if we recover in less than a year, boah, bravo. And uh, every uh, uh, government is trying to help. Every government is conscious that we need help, that we cannot let the small companies die, that we need work, workmanship, that we cannot lose people. So uh, the recovery is for me, uh, uh, end of April uh, 2021. But on the other hand, as much as there is pain, there will be a lot of positive things. And the most positive element is that we will have to rethink spiritually 
about the new century. I used to say the new century has not started yet. I said that f four months ago, end of December 2019, I said in a conference, we are not yet in the 21st century. And people said, how can you say that? It's the year 2020 in a few days, and you say we are not in the 21st century. I said, mathematically, we are not in the, tw we are in the 21st century. I also can calculate. I'm not stupid. I know that from the mathematics, we are in the 21st century. But who is shaping this century? Who is in command? Who is uh, 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 the managing the century? It's all people like me, born in the 20th, and we have imported into the new century our methods our concepts, our uh, uh, um, uh, philosophy, uh, our political systems, our capitalism system, eventually our racist uh, uh, deviations, etc., etc. Nothing has changed. We have only changed the date. But the century needs not a new date. It needs a new approach a new way to handle this century. And who will bring this? The millenniums. The millenniums will save planet Earth. They will save the century. And now, thanks, if I may say thanks, uh, of, of to the virus, this will be the breaking point where suddenly all the people from the 20th century cannot go on as they were doing it in the 20th and in the beginning of the 21st, they will have to adapt. And how can they adapt? They must adapt by learning. They must adapt by listening. They must adapt by looking. And the virus is giving us a lot of instructions. The first instruction the virus is giving us is that life is the most important asset that we have. We have believed for many years, wow, life, life. No, life is an extraordinary asset. Now that death is coming so close, now that, that we will have probably three, four, five hundred thousand people dying, in every family there will be somebody related to somebody who, who died, suddenly life has another, uh, uh, has another appearance. Life has another value. The second thing we're going to learn, love. God damn, love is what we need. The Beatles were singing it in 67. All we need is love. And love is that you are with people. You can speak with people. You can connect with people. You can gather with people. You can eat with people. You can uh, uh, enjoy with people. You can love with, with people, etc., etc. So we are discovering that we are not alone, that we cannot live alone, that we success can never be built alone. We need help, we need support, we need people. We, this is another discovery. We need solidarity. We need to share. Uh, we need to love. We need to respect. These are values that we knew from religion, but <laughs> we had forgotten them, you know. Uh, 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 we must also, we are going to learn that we are all interdependent. We are not living anymore in a country. We are living in planet, <laughs> you know, because we are all connected in a certain way by suppliers here, by uh, uh, other elements here, by food coming from there. We are all, we are one. We are a village. Planet has become a village. We are also learning that if we are all in a village, whatever you destroy, you destroy not only for you, you destroy for, the, for everybody. So there's a new conscious coming for ecology. Um, we, we will also learn that family is one of the strongest elements in our equilibrium, we need family and family and friends together. That helps us to uh, uh, develop ourselves. We are learning to be patient because now we have no choice. <laughs> I, I, you can be the most dynamic guy. When you live in confinement, 
you have to have patience and you have to invent a new way to take advantage of the confinement and not just sit there and, and cry. You must reinvent your, uh, the, your, your, your daily uh, hours what to do. We will also <laughs> learn to be thankful and to be humble. Can you imagine whatever we have invented in pharmacology, in biology, and we have a virus that suddenly boom, destroys us. That tells us, come on guys, even if we are in the 21st century, let's be humble. We had the Spanish flu uh, 100 years ago, but <laughs> where are we now? <laughs> more or less at the same level than 100 years ago, with all the technology, etc. So we need to become humble. And we will also have to learn, because that's the only way to get out, to stay strong and to act like strong, not like arrogant, like strong. If you are weak and you behave weak, how can you get strong? If you are weak and you behave like strong, not arrogant, but just like strong, then you have a chance eventually to one day get strong. So all this is coming. And then it's coming, you have to, you have to accelerate or to shift to the digital shopping. The digital shopping, it's the biggest chance for them. We should all buy Amazon shares now. They, they are going. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not in the banking system. <laughs> I said it just like that. Uh, well, you're right. Let's, let's buy GD.com, let's buy Alibaba, let's buy Amazon. <laughs> because these people, not, they are not the only ones, but these people have a huge future. Because the few people who are not used to digital shopping, they are getting used now about that. You know, we, we, the, the whole environmental consciousness, this is something that we had in words, yes, more or less. But what were we doing? Today, planet is, planet is so happy again. You can hear the birds, you can see animals. Planet says to us, thank you for giving me. <laughs> so it's the holidays of planet today. So we have to rethink about planet. And then there comes the, the ethical uh, uh, elements, we have to, be, uh, to, get, to develop solidarity. We have to develop help. When I see Italy, they are in the mess, and Italy belongs to e the EU, the European Union. But what is this European Union doing to help Italy? Nothing! You know, and if we cannot help another country that is next to us, it's like if something terrible happens in Malaysia, Singapore would for sure help. So, and we will have, mostly in Europe, there's a new chance to consolidate and to make Europe become real. And countries must, we must help, we must share, and, and etc. So you see, um, I would say there are a lot of opportunities. We have a lot to learn. And this is a unique chance, although it's a disaster, I agree. Also, it's a catastrophe to have two, three, five hundred thousand people dying. Also, it's a catastrophe for all the small businesses that might not survive. Uh, it's a catastrophe for all the people who are jobless. You know, I, in, in America yesterday, they, they spoke about 6.6 .6 million jobless people. It's a catastrophe. And, uh, uh, but beside was all this catastrophe, we have to see there is a positive sign if we can interpret what God has given us, what planet has just given us is an advice. It's a, it's a, a um, they tell us, hey, hey, hey guys, stop. Please stop again and let's think now how we go on to the future. So that's my appreciation uh, way. But you know, I, I love the way that you, you framed this because, and, and I think it's for the first time I thought about it, but you're absolutely right. We're in the third millennium, but we're still being led by the old ways. And I think that what we see now 
um, is a catastrophic uh, failing of the old ways. You know, you see, for example, in the United States, even though I love the United States, my heart goes out there, that you have states bidding against each other trying to get medical equipment. And it's not working. This It shouldn't have to be in this way. It should be centralized and it should be done efficiently. I think that for you, Mr. Beaver, and, and this is something I always find very interesting. People consider you to be um, one of, if not the greatest success in the watch industry. But you were never driven by capitalism. You were never driven by purely the creation of wealth, even though I'm, you know, I'm sure you've done you know, very well as a result of this. But if you look at the last half of the 20th century, it was driven purely by an unchecked form of capitalism where it was very cynical. And all everyone ever wanted to do was to maximize their profits, no matter what the cost, no matter the human cost, no matter the cost on the environment. And I think what is really remarkable is that the new generation, um, guys like your son, Pierre, um, the millennials, and even the generation after them, you know, when they come to in, for an interview or when I speak to them, the first thing they want to talk about is what, is what are your corporate ethics? Because I think that the world needs to change in terms of it is no longer um, it's no longer conscionable for you to grow your business at the expense of impacting humans in a negative way and, and, and at the expense of impacting uh, the planet in a negative way. And maybe this was in some ways the wake up call that we needed. Absolutely. And you know, uh, uh, you, you, you're, you're absolutely right. And also for me, you're right. I come from the hippie uh, generation and I have uh, lost my hippie health. Uh, I maybe uh, don't have the same hippie dress anymore, but in my heart, uh, I'm still a hippie. And the hippies were the first people who, who were conscious about ecology. <laughs> we were already eating bio, you know, and we were not eating Uncle Ben's white rice. We were eating the rice that is uh, 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 still with the, the cover around it, you know. Oh, so yes. um, um, that was you're right. I, I never, I never was a real capitalist. I am a liberal. I'm for freedom, uh, but of course, uh, uh, I always have tried to share. And um, maybe you don't know it. I don't know if you know, but a lot of people know it. In 1989, I decided at Blancpain, when I owned Blancpain, that I would give a week holidays to my people. And I decided that this week of holidays would be end of October. So end of October, I closed the factory for one week. But I said, guys, I offer you holidays, but holidays with me. So I have sent a, a, a luggage to everybody, an empty luggage, so that everybody had the same luggage. Inside the luggage, there was a letter uh, telling the people where we were going to holidays and what uh, different uh, 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 clothes they had to bring. So I hired a plane from Swiss Air. In those days, it was called Swiss Air. Um, and the plane flew from uh, Geneva uh, to Napoli. And we started our holidays, one week holidays in Napoli. Uh, from Napoli, we went to Pestos, from Pestos, we went to Pompeii, and from Pompeii, we went to Capri, and then after five days, we came back. And, you know, uh, the bookkeeper in the beginning, we were a private company, so it was my money. He said to me, but are you crazy? For one week, we will have no production. And for one week, how much are you going to spend? I said, we're going to spend half a million for one week with uh, 100 people. He said, but Mr. Beaver, this is crazy. The people already have three, four or five week holidays. I said, but that's in their contract. I give them nothing. I employ people who have a contract where it's written four weeks holidays. So what do I give? I give zero. I want to give one week holidays and they will come with me and I will be together for one week. We went one week for holidays. We came back on a Friday uh, and on a Monday, I had a nice letter with uh, all the signatures and it was written on this letter, thank you, Mr. Beaver, in order not to lose five days production, we all commit, everybody who has signed this letter is committed to come and work five Sundays. Like this, till, the, till Christmas, we will not have lost any production day. And that is the 
it's fantastic. This is the best, one of the best moments of my life. Because I realized when you give, people give back. But you must start to give first. How can somebody give back when he has never received? You can only give back what you have received. <laughs> if you have nothing, what can you give back? So uh, 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 that, is, that was, just to tell you, that was my spirit. That was my way of behaving. And it has never, even today, it has never changed. To come back to the 21st century, uh, very quickly, because I just have the idea now. When the Spanish flu came, I don't remember, 1916 or 1918, I think it was 1918, um, we, we developed uh, uh, a confinement. The, the principle of confinement was invented as the best tool to fight a, a pandemic, a, a virus, uh, and that was what was done in 1918 with the Spanish flu. Now comes the new flu, the new virus. What did most 99% of the countries do? They repeated the same strategy than with the Spanish flu, confinement. What did the new countries did? Korea, Singapore, and a little bit uh, uh, Hong Kong. They used technology to fight uh, a virus, not the old method <laughs> of 1918. They invented with the phone, with uh, uh, the, the internet, they invented a new way that belongs to the 21st century to fight. All the other countries just repeated the same receipt than in 1918. And who has been the most successful? Singapore. Korea and somehow Hong Kong, because they have used methodology of today, while all the others have copied the methodology of 100 years ago. And this is, you know, this is a sign. We, in life, you cannot copy yesterday, because Today is not the copy of yesterday, even if it looks like, but it's, it's not. Eventually, if you are the director of a museum, okay, then you can collect yesterday because the museum needs yesterday. But in our own life, life is going on and we always have to adapt. And today, the adaptation will come, the after virus, and we should take advantage of the confinement to think to everybody should think for himself, how do I go, how do I am going to evolute in order to jump into the after virus period, not with the same clothes, not with the same shoes that the ones I had before virus. You know, you, it's interesting that you mentioned that it's before and after the virus, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the fact that we're having this video conference right now, and this is the way we're conversing now, and will be for quite a, quite a while longer, the primary means that people are communicating, the fact that people are exercising through their computer screens, the fact that people are socializing through their computer screens, that they're being entertained through their computer screens. Do you see it, and you'd mentioned a greater digitalization of the world, do you see this as being something that the luxury world needs to adapt to and adapt to very quickly also? Yes, the luxury world needs to adapt on, on two levels. Uh, first, on technology, for sure. And uh, for sure. And on the digital shopping, etc. There is not even a doubt. They need to adapt on the digital world. And so, so many companies are already late. Uh, that is the first thing. But then, on the second level, we also need to evolve on the individualization. We have to think the customer in a 360 degree strategy. <laughs> that means the, the customer is the center of the company. Who is the boss in a, in a brand? It's not the CEO. God damn, it would be so easy if he would be the boss. It's the customer. He is the boss. And the more you look after him, the more you are 360 degrees around him, the more you will understand his needs. 
and the more you will please him. And if you are ex cathedra, if you are sitting in your in your in your board, if you are sitting in your factory, how can you understand the customer? The customer is the center of the company. He is the boss, and the boss has a uh, has a wife. And who's who's the boss's wife? It's the product. You have a, a king. That's the customer, and you have a queen. That's the product, and the king must love the queen, and then they gather together, and then they have babies, and that means then you have turnover. <laughs> so we have to reinvent who is the king and who is the queen. That's an incredible lesson, and if we do that, then we can have a 360 degree strategy around. The king and the queen. I love this the, the way you've always said this. So basically, you've always said there's a king and the queen. The king being the customer, and the queen being the pro, uh, product. In this case, a watch. And your job, your mission, has always been to be able to make them fall in love. But they're never going to fall in love if they're never in the same place at the same time. Which is why. <laughs> this is with... why you need social media. Yes. to have them come together. This is why you need PR to come together. This is why you need the event marketing to bring those two together. Because if the king lives in Switzerland and the queen uh, uh, lives in Singapore and they never travel, how can they fall in love? I mean, they, they, they must gather. And that's what, what we have to do. We have to, you're absolutely right. We, and that's why I invented more or less the event marketing. We were doing events just to gather, to bring those two people. A lot of guys said to me, why do you do all these events? Uh, Hublot has every day an event somewhere in the world. I said, because we need to bring the customer and the queen together. And we cannot bring them together by sitting in our, in our office. We need to bring them together by organizing an event. And that has given birth to what I call the event marketing. And now in this post sort of coronavirus age, I suppose the way in which people are socializing, that we're communicating, the way that they're interacting with the world is, is purely digital. And because of that, the industry really needs to capitalize on that. At some point, they should probably even start using Zoom to expose new watches to people as well, you know? Um, yeah. So Patek Philippe did something quite interesting recently. Um, I think a lot of their authorized dealers were in a challenging position because the governments had shut the shops down. So no one could shop anymore. So Patek Philippe, which is, you know, normally considered to be quite a conservative brand. I mean, it's one of our favorite brands, if not our favorite brand, but from a, con you know, from a management perspective, it's conservative in a good way. They did something which I thought was incredibly innovative in that they gave the authorized dealers the possibility to sell their watches online. What do you think of this? What I think about this? Genius, 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 genius. That's it. I mean, how come Patek Philippe is the only brand who thought about that? <laughs> I mean, they are probably the brand that needs it the less. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. But they are the first to yes. think about it. And that tells you something about the brand, Patek Philippe. And I admire and I respect and I love Patek Philippe even more now that they, they show leadership, not only in, in the watchmaking art. <laughs> they, they are leaders all over the places, not only yeah. about, uh, uh, on the watchmaking art. I think They're, it's just a genius idea. And, and also... Genius. There's a, always a, and there's a tr tremendous ethical dimension to this also, because I think that they're making this step, which is a brilliant move also, but they're also allowing their authorized dealers who now still have to pay the rent in their shop, still have to pay some amount of money for their staff, still have the inventory in their safes. They're giving them the possibility to, to eat, basically, to be able to make their rent. And I think that's a wonderful thing, don't you? It's the first after various concept. Yes. We have seen now the birth of the first after virus concept. Before virus, this would not have happened. So you see the first results 
of the after virus is the Patek Philippe in initiative. <laughs> and and you, would you suggest that to every major watch brand, please consider to do this now? Because yes. first of all, it will benefit you tremendously. And second of all, it will benefit everyone that is your partner tremendously also. Yes, yes. Some brands probably didn't need to do it because they, they already had allowed in the past their uh, customers, uh, their retailers to uh, promote and to sell watches on the internet. But most of the brands had forbidden it. But uh, there are brands who had allowed it already, so they didn't need to do it. But for a traditional brand like Patek, a high quality brand like Patek, an exclusive and expensive brand like Patek, to have done this is, means they have understood what to do after a virus concept. And, the, the, and that will never, you know, they cannot say now in three months, and I, let's suppose that in September the virus is gone. They well, cannot so. now suddenly say, hey, now you have to stop. <laughs> you cannot stop it anymore. Right. Yeah, so, it's something that, that it, it's finished. Yeah. This is for me one of the first after virus concept that is born. If I was the CEO of a major brand, and I would never want to put myself in this place because I know they have their other challenges. But if the, for the moment I saw Paddock do this, and I completely agree with you, Mr. Beaver, that once the virus is under control, and let's hope to God that it's soon, they, you will never be able to, to go back to the old ways. And I would, whatever reason, you know, this, this being stuck in this old mentality of not allowing authorized dealers to sell on, online, you must get yourself out of this ghetto of this mindset that has become immediately anachronistic and even dangerous overnight. Yes, I agree. And you know, uh, you can never go back from, from the future. <laughs> the future goes <laughs> uh, to tomorrow. The future never goes to yesterday. So if, if your, um, your good friend and, and uh, former uh, colleague Jean-Fred Dufour is watching this, would you suggest that Rolex does this as well? Um, you know, it's difficult for me to suggest to the king what to do. <laughs> Rolex is the king, he has the crown. And John Fred is wearing the crown, you know, the Rolex crown, boom. It's very difficult to, <laughs> to have a friend who has the crown on his head and then to give him instructions. Uh, I did it when he was younger <laughs> and he learned a lot from me uh, and I'm very proud of him. <laughs> Uh, but I, I honestly, I, it's not that I want to escape the question. I don't know enough sufficient. Rolex is a brand uh, that very few people, a lot pretend to know the brand, but very few people know the brand. Yes. Very few people know how much they produce. Very yes. few people know how much uh, uh, they make uh, profit. Very few people uh, uh, um, uh, uh, understand uh, what, what they are doing. But, uh, so before, I know much better Patek, for instance, than I know Rolex. Yes. So before giving advice to Jean-Fred, um, I would have to know more about uh, Rolex. But somehow, I believe there will be a trend and I call it the digital shopping, and digital shopping will not be able to be stopped. Uh, Ferrari, Lamborghini, they will all go through digital shopping. That's, <laughs> there's no doubt. You see, and digital shopping has already a little bit, a little bit, a very little bit uh, started with the cars. I went to, to Porsche uh, uh, and uh, they said to me, ah, we, we can configure the car you would like to buy as, uh, uh, according to your different desires. And so they had a big screen and the guy was playing all up and said, ah, oh, for the leather, do you want this or this or this? So it's already, and I didn't see the car. <laughs> and the car will come out in 2021. Uh, so it's already a little bit digital shopping because yes. I could have done this alone <laughs> in my house, in my, with my computer, and to get my kids, and everybody would have participated, ah, oh, papa, take this color, yes. color. So you can already do it. The digital shopping <laughs> will not, nobody will be able to stop it. That's it. 
if you were the CEO of a watch brand or even say the CEO of a watch group, um, and with the understanding that, well, let's exclude LVMH group because they actually managed to have the last watch fair and very possibly the last watch fair of 2020 when they had the watch fair in Dubai. But if you were the CEO of a, a Richemont brand or a Swatch group brand or, or one of the major uh, brands um, and understanding that there's no more watch fairs, there's no more time to move, there's no more watches and wonders, there's no more Basel Wharf this year, what would you do? Would you still release new watches? Would you release them through a digital sort of platform? Would you do uh, hopefully local market events, uh, hopefully when this is over? Um, what would you do? Or would you not launch anything at all? It very, it very much depends uh, where is your brand. If your brand, to say something, is Swatch watches. Swatch has lived Every year we've coming out with two, three or four collections, a little bit like the fashion industry. If that's your, 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 uh, if that's where you are, you are close to the fashion industry, you need novelties to make moves, uh, uh, then of course you will need to find a way to bring out these collections. If your brand is like Rolex, who, I exaggerate, who has done the same models more or less for 50 years, who have very, very strong innovation, but apparently they look very minor, then you can say without a doubt, come on guys, <laughs> we, we, in one year, we are already in 2021, or in nine months, we are in January already, 21, let's forget 2020, and let's bring the, all these novelties in 2021, January or February or March. So you see, you, you cannot give one answer. It all depends where is your brand. Uh, a brand like Hublot, who relies on 40% of the people who buy a Hublot, who have bought a Hublot in 2019, they have bought their second or their third or the fourth or the fifth or the seventh or the tenth. Of, of, uh, so Hublot needs innovation in order to enable to his customer to buy the second watch. <laughs> if you have no innovation, how can you buy a second one? <laughs> Eventually, if you want to offer to your brother a watch, okay. But for yourself, you need innovations. With no innovation, I will not buy a second one. So you see, it all depends where is your brand. Uh, and then you can give an answer, but you cannot give one answer that is good for every brand. That's, uh, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that, that if I were Rolex though, it's not my place to say anything, I would do exactly that. I would probably just not even launch anything this year and wait till January next year when we've already determined that Basel World is going to happen. And let's hope that we're all there <laughs> in good spirit. <laughs> Um, do you feel as if that uh, when we get come out of this post coronavirus um, atmosphere, people are still going to want luxury objects like a wristwatch? People after the virus, they will need, as I said before, love. And what is love? <sighs> okay, love as a general uh, concept, not between just two people. Uh, but love is God first. And then what else is uh, love? Love is art. <laughs> art, the artist, you know, th this is an expression of love. And love and art and God, what do they have in common? They have in common that they are all the three eternal. God is eternal. The God of the Catholics have never changed. <laughs> he's always the same. Yeah. Nobody knows him, but he's the same. <laughs> just, just <laughs> uh, 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 Picasso, Mozart, or the Beatles, they are still alive. <laughs> Picasso is alive. He is alive. And Mozart is alive every day. Millions of people are listening to Mozart, are dreaming with Mozart. So you Beatles see- more relevant than ever, you know? Exactly. So you see art is eternal. And then 
What about the watchmaking art? But that's also eternal. The watchmaking industry might not be eternal because the quartz movement might one day become obsolete or the batteries might disappear and become obsolete. A connected watch might become obsolete, but a mechanical watch, a fine mechanical watch in 100, 200, 300, 500 years will still work. It will work and work and work and work. So where people are going now after the virus, they will go for real value. They will go for substance. They will go for eternity. Because if you are connected to eternity, wow, that's the dream of everybody. Everybody dreams to be eternal. Everybody dreams to be connected to eternity. And the watch is one of the way to connect yourself to eternity and to wear on your wrist a soul, to wear on your wrist a piece of art and to wear on your wrist a piece of eternity. So the watchmaking art is going to have an incredible development. The watchmaking industry that's a little bit different. That depends on the technology. It depends how the connected watch develops or do we have new inventions for new batteries or, or for the quartz. That is different. But the watchmaking art and all these brands that are in the watchmaking art, from Rolex to Patek, from Patek to FP Jour, etc. All these brands have an incredible future. It's the... It, <laughs> it's paradise for them. The after virus is the best environment that all these artistical brands can get. I think when there's this wonderful renewed sense of optimism when all this darkness finally is eradicated or at least compressed, uh, controlled and suppressed, uh, there's going to be a wonderful and I think very robust rebound, you know, and I think you're right. I think by, by next year, early quarter of next year, um, hopefully we'll see quite a bit of um, optimism. Um, do you feel, however, that when people come back, they may not necessarily buy the same watches as before? Because what we saw in 2008, after the financial crisis, was the rise of vintage and a retreat to classicism. And we hadn't seen that for a while, you know? Um, do you, what do you think? Of course, the new generation after the virus, the millenniums, they will not buy the same watch than their fathers and mothers. <laughs> they, they want inspiration from the future. <laughs> they don't want inspiration from the past. They don't want to wear the shoes of their papas. <laughs> A few will do, of course, but they will want to connect to their generation to their vision, to their technology, to their innovation, to their creativity. That's where they want to connect. They don't want to connect to yesterday because they are tomorrow and tomorrow doesn't connect to yesterday. So the new generation after the virus in three or five or 10 years, they will want their own style, their own vision, not ours. And we will have to adapt. We have seen it a little bit already. We're in the auctions of the Impressionists. The Impressionists of every auction house, Philips, uh, Christie, Sotheby's, was always the number one uh, uh, turnover. <laughs> Who is now the number one? Uh, 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 temporary art has become suddenly number one and not anymore Impressionists. Hey, why? Because we have a new generation coming, buying with their eyes, with yes. their concepts, with yes. their taste, and not a replica of the father and the mother. And thanks God, if, if a generation is the replica of yesterday, that's a generation that will die. The generation must go on and must go to the future. And that, therefore, don't expect tomorrow to be, as I said before, a copy of yesterday. That would be too easy. You're absolutely right. I remember that you know, in the 80s, and I guess the early 90s, when uh, Impressionism was king. And then if you look at it just in the last, you know, let's say 10 years, it's been like, for example, Jean-Michel Basquiat has become the same price as a Van Gogh, right? Hey, which is, yes. which is yes. incredible. 
Yes. And then if you look at that guy, he's driving a different car. He's probably driving a Tesla, you know, and he's wearing a different watch. He's probably wearing a Paul Newman Daytona or maybe a, a vintage paddock, of, you know, uh, something like that. It's very interesting, don't you think? It's extremely interesting, but it's extremely worrying also for people who cannot adapt. <laughs> it's also worrying for people. You know, if you look at the antique shops, uh, antique furniture from the 18th century, is gone. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, or or even which I love personally a lot, Art Nouveau. Yeah. The prices of Art Nouveau have totally dropped. So. You don't mind. Stuff like this as well. It, it, it's very, very. You must. One must be very careful. Things are. are there are evolutions, and the evolutions we have to adapt to the evolution, or we're going to die. If you are a company, if you have to adapt, you have to adapt. The king, <laughs> the new king, cannot be <laughs> the copy of the king of the 17th century. They don't have the same taste. So as we had the, in the center of our brand, we have the king. We must, if the king is now suddenly younger and his successor is a young man that is 25 years old because his father that was 80 has died. God, we cannot handle this young 25 year old guy like the old king. He must be handled like the new king. The, and the new king has all the symbols and, and, and all the values of his new generation. Well, you have an advantage because you have a new king in your house who is Pierre. Um, <laughs> and he is really representative of this generation, you know. And you can see his tastes are, well, first of all, his knowledge of watches is incredible. Actually, I, when I hear him speak about watches, I get quite intimidated. I feel a bit like the student in the classroom where I'm hoping he doesn't ask me a question because already the conversation's at a much higher level, you know? But um, what does he like? What is he passionate about? What do you think that will be the future taste of the next generation? To sum it, to sum it up very simply, uh, he loves steel. Okay. Uh, he loves automatic. He loves sport. And then he goes Rolex, Patek, AP. Uh, <laughs> thanks God for me, a little bit in blue, <laughs> and, <laughs> and a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, uh, Richard Mill. And now he develops an incredible taste and an incredible uh, wish to collect FP Jour. Ah, okay. And I can see S. Peugeot coming up. Yes. And F. Peugeot is absolutely the right brand for the after virus because he is an artist. He has incredible innovation in the tradition. So he is innovating, but he still is tradition. When he makes limited edition, there are 20 pieces. So there are real limited editions. And I see, uh, uh, I, 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 can, I see it with my eyes because I observe Pierre. I see that suddenly F.P. Jour is developing. I mean, he's already developed, sorry. He's developing among young. Wow. And before F.P. Jour, you had to be at least 40, 50 years old to enjoy. And now there's young guys, 18 years old, 20 years old, they enjoy. Uh, FP Jour. That's remarkable. And that is the first, that are signs that uh, that you have to observe and you have to learn from these signs in order to be right uh, in a few years. Mr. Viva, I, I've been watching and it makes me very um, proud to be part of this industry when you see the efforts that all the different groups are making. Um, especially, you know, for, uh, at LVMH Group, you can see the money that they've donated to uh, fight uh, this virus. And I found it really remarkable that a brand like Bulgari, for example, is trans transforming a perfume manufacturer into a, um, a plant for manufacturing hand sanitizer in Italy so they can send out 6,000 bottles a year. What, since, since the luxury business is, is about creating pleasure, it's about creating love. And you can't have love without, first of all, human beings. What responsibility do you feel that the luxury industry has to help as much as they can um, to fight what's going on right now? You know, the, 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 the luxury industry has to sell 
or to give birth to dreams. And the beauty of luxury is that it makes you dream during daytime. <laughs> we usually dream during night. <laughs> uh, and we usually don't remember our dreams during the night. And there is one element that helps you to dream when you are awake and during daytime. That's luxury. And among luxury, I would put, of course, because luxury is art, luxury is culture, luxury is tradition, luxury is innovation, luxury is creativity, and luxury is love. And so love and luxury helps you to dream also during the day. And that is for me next to health, because that's the first luxury we have, next to health, if we can have love and if we can have dreams, wow, then we are really in luxury. And that is the responsibility of luxury. It's, it, it, it is to promote the honest and a, a, a dream that is based on substance and to promote the dreams. And then we have a new um, a task uh, a new uh, objective, uh, uh, a new mission, and that's, that would be beautiful. And I'm dreaming <laughs> to be part of this movement to bring dreams to people. Excellent. Do you feel that every, every brand, um, every group should make some concerted effort to try to help the crisis in, in some ways, whether it be through uh, the manufacturing of something like hand sanitizer, or is it possible to, to use a production line to create ventilator or parts for ventilator machines? I mean, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just wondering, do you think that's oh, something every, that- Every brand should be innovative, how the best they can help. And uh, 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 s some brands can be innovative and they can help in doing this, uh, um, yeah, this alcohol for the hands. Of course, uh, if you are in the machine industry, it might be difficult in that way to help, but you can do the, the ventilators for the lungs. So every industry has one part where they can help and they have to invent and to have to find where they can transform a little bit their industry 1% or 10% or 0.1% or of their facilities in order to contribute to solidarity. May I ask you one, uh, and I, I know I've kept you quite a while, Mr. Bieber, so I won't, I won't keep you that much longer, but um, uh, one question that I, I find a little bit troubling related to the world. So the world has never been more connected than today, but the world has never been more polarized than today, if you get what I'm saying, you know? And what you see now, is the economy in China restarting and even there's some, you know, sort of sales happening and so on. And I worry that when people watch this on the news, the Western countries who are so badly afflicted right now will become angry because the perception in their minds was that the virus originated in, in China. You know, you have even President Trump say over and over again, this is a Chinese virus. I think he finally had to retract that because in America now you have a hundred hate crimes against Asian Americans today. And I, I, it's, it's disturbing to me because in the period of a crisis, you see both the best in humanity, like you see the national health care uh, in England asked for 250,000 volunteers to help out because they were overloaded and they got 600,000 volunteers. You know, when you see the incredible effort that um, the men and women uh, who are even were in retirement, who are coming out of retirement to try to help fight, fight this, um, it gives you a great deal of hope. But there is this polarizing force between, you know, kind of good and, and inspiration and humanity and, and ugliness in terms of racism that's happening. Do you think that this will still continue in a post-coronavirus world or will we forget about it? Because I think in some ways it will be, too, it will be difficult to forget about this. I think, I think we will forget about this. You know, this is, this is a, an old habit of the 20th century. It's to exploit politically <laughs> uh, an event. And if you exploit 
an event for political reasons, then they are not the right reasons. <laughs> uh, that's too easy. Uh, and thanks to uh, the opening of the media, this can be fighted. Um, uh, so I don't trust, I trust people to realize what has been exploited for political or economical reasons and what is the truth. And the truth is that a drama can never be exploited. A drama, we must show solidarity. We must speak like one. And even the different political parties, they for one time, they must all go behind the leader. If they are right side, left side, who cares? We are here to fight together. Uh, and, and so never try, never do that to exploit any big accident or explosion like Chernobyl or the tsunami or now the virus cannot be exploited. It cannot. And it will not serve the ones who do it. Believe me. It, because people are not dumb. And today, thanks to the opening of the press, of the communication, this cannot work. It cannot work. And I'm very pleased that President Trump stopped to say the Chinese uh, virus, because uh, wherever it comes from, you cannot say the Chinese virus, you know, somehow. So, but uh, I don't want to go into politics. But nevertheless, I say, to myself, and I believe that we should not exploit drama, cannot be exploited. We must all be behind and we all must bring us together to fight the drama, not to exploit and not to put our finger, ah, oh, this drama is done because of this or this or that. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Beaver. Uh, you know, you give us um, an amazing uh, a hope. Um, I think uh, what you advise us in the beginning uh, to, to stay united um, and to be optimistic and to be strong. And I love, the, I love that you said that, this as well. Not arrogant, but strong was wonderful. Um, it's funny because my whole life, I've, I've never really liked the Beatles. I've always um, liked the Rolling Stones, but then just two or three days ago, I started listening to the Beatles and I started crying because I think we need the Beatles now more than ever. And in the same more way- More than ever, more we, than ever. Need you now more than ever as well, Mr. Beaver. So thank you. We still consider you to be uh, the greatest leader in this industry. And, uh, and, and you know, you, you're teaching us all the time. So thank you so much, Mr. Beaver. Thank you, Wade. Thank you for the interview. See you soon in okay. Singapore when the virus is gone. Huh? Absolutely. I love it. Thank you, Mr. Beaver. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.